Before we start this show, just a word from our sponsor. 20 by 20 Apparel. Founded in 2015, 20 by 20 Apparel brings original tributes to pro wrestling's classic arenas, moments, and events. They look to spotlight the bloopers, bleeps, and body slams along with the biggest, smallest, strangest, and strongest that pro wrestling has had to offer. Along with their awesome line of pro wrestling apparel, they do offer many services. In the world of wrestling, there are hundreds of shirts, promotions, flyers, social media accounts, and ads. Don't get lost in the sea of parody shirts and display fonts. They can provide professional graphic design services at a reasonable price. 20 by 20 also hand screen prints all the tees in-house. If you would like to discuss possible run of tees, posters, koozies, foam fingers, or whatever, drop them a line. Go to 20 by 20 apparel. That's the number 20 X, the number 20 apparel.com. Now let's get to the show. Fresh is the word. I'm Jim Duggan, got long wood for plenty hoes. I keep it fresher than fresh, but you already know. You suck as bummy, I'm money, I got a ton of flows. My weed loud like a motherfucking thunder roll. Your shit quiet like you ballin' on a budget though. We see your kicks and we laugh and yell the water though. You see me shining like a suit on puffy. You know my grindin' shit is too strong, buddy. That's why the dude call money. I be stuntin' like it's nothing at all. Cause it's nothing to me, it's probably something to y'all. Trying to smoke like me, then come and fuck with your dog. Got a closet full of kicks, you can't cop it the mall. And I'm fresher than the freshest, you can tell it's in my essence. Bitch, you see the way I'm rapping? Yes, I do this shit to death. I tell I'm running out of breath. I tell somebody cut a check. But either way, you know it's fresh. But either way, you know it's fresh. Fresh. We fresh. 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 God damn it, we fresh. Welcome to the Fresh of the Word podcast. I'm your host, Kelly K. Fresh Frazier. And on Fresh of the Word, we like to deliver wisdom through great stories from the minds of bright creatives of pop culture. Through those stories, we like to dissect the journey of our guests and present actionable lessons and advice for our listeners, no matter what career or avenue of artistry they pursue. And before we get into this episode, I want to give a shout out to Knox Money, Bang Belushi, and Foul Mouth for the theme music for Fresh of the Word. And if you would like to support the podcast, you can always go to freshofthepodcast.com and just share any of the links for any of the episodes on any of your social media platforms. And also, you can subscribe to Fresh of the Word pretty much anywhere that podcasts are streamed. And that includes Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, pretty much everywhere. And please, rate and review, especially on Apple Podcasts. It would definitely help out the show. If you want to contact me, you can always reach me by email at djkfresh at gmail.com. Or you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at K Fresh is the word, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash K Fresh. And you can also follow Fresh is the word on Twitter at Fresh is the word, and that's is with IZ, Instagram at Fresh is the word podcast, and Facebook at facebook.com slash Fresh is the podcast. And this is episode 160. And this episode features a spotlight panel that yours truly, K Fresh, moderated at this year's Toronto Comic Arts Festival. Back on May 12th, with Vivek Sharia and Ness Lee, the creators of the book Death Threat, released via Arsenal Pulp Press. Vivek Sharia is an artist living in Calgary, Alberta, whose body of work crosses the boundaries of music, literature, visual art, theater, and film. And Ness Lee is an illustrator artist based out of Toronto, and her work explores the sense of drawing, painting, mixed media sculpture, and murals. During the panel, we talked about why they did the book based on the transphobic hate mail that Vivek began receiving back in 2017 and what they hoped the people get out of it, why they did the book in a particular style, horror and humor, using comics to tell this story, how the book fits with Vivek's work in other media, the social responsibility when you are part of a marginalized group, the role of allies, and getting trapped in your own brand identity and the struggle to break out of it. Before we get into this spotlight panel that I moderated, I just want to remind you how you can support Fresh is the Word. 
you can always go to patreon.com slash fresh is the word. And for as little as a dollar, you can support me and fresh is the word and everything I'm trying to do. And for the $3 a month tier, you get access to the Patreon only exclusive episodes where I dig deep into my audio archives of interviews that I did outside of fresh is the word for various publications some interviews, I didn't even use any of the uh, interviews at all. So uh, some of them are really exclusive. So if you are definitely interested in helping out Fresh of the Word, there's a lot of goodies from my archives that I'm, that I'm going to start to share with you. We already got interviews up with Danny Brown, Cool Keith, 12th Planet, and Jay Dilla's mom, Ma Dukes. So go to patreon.com slash fresh is the word and sign up for one of the tiers and there's a few tiers that you can actually be a part of the podcast so once again go to patreon.com slash fresh the word all right let's get into the audio of the spotlight panel that i moderated at the toronto comic arts festival this year with vivek shreya and nestle all right thank you for attending tcaf uh, we're here with um, Nestle and uh, Vivek Shreya for the Death Threat book. Give a round of applause. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can see how embarrassed they already are. Um, before we get I into like everything... I bossy moderators. Oh, bossy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll try to be as bossy as I can. All right, let's get on to our conversation about Death Threat. Okay, to start things off, what was the idea behind doing this story, Death Threats? Just to kind of uh, break down and introduce you for, uh, yourselves first in, in what you did for the book. I, I drew it. <laughs> <laughs> I drew it. <laughs> I, did, I did the art of it. And then <laughs> I kind of wrote it, but I also kind of didn't write it because there is, uh, the book is essentially based on uh, or incorporates um, a series of death threats and hate mail that I got from a stranger. And uh, usually I just like block those things or mute them. Uh, you know, the tranny tweets on Twitter, I just uh, mute. But uh, this person, you know, used like cultural language and referenced my mom and talked about how their mom, their mom was hunting me in the woods. And so it was really hard not to picture what they were saying, and so then I approached Ness and was like, do you want to draw these strange letters? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, okay. <laughs> what did you present to her in regards to, uh, for, for, the, for the book, and then, you know, what was your sort of idea when you saw all these, well, these it letters? The same, the same um, line of, like, it was a very visual, very visual letter that went up and, like, sent those letters to me, and then um, also just to, like, be able to, in, in ways, like reclaim the narrative of the situation and and um, and do it in a spin where, where we can we can also put it out out there for others to be like aware and more aware and stuff like that too. Yeah. How how important do you feel like it is to sort of acknowledge this behavior to try to fight it? I mean, I think at the core of the book, I'm trying to like be part of a conversation about the ways that I think we've been complicit in the dissemination of hate on the internet. I think that, um, you know, the thing I've been saying is that like a couple years ago, people actually had the decency to like block out their names or use the egg icon on Twitter if they were trolling you. And now it's just like, they just use their faces, they just use their names um, because there's really no consequence, right? So I think that like, you know, one of the, the things that I was hoping to talk about through the book was just the ways that I think that, um, like I don't have the answer, but I do think that we should be finding more ways to push back against a lot of these sites who we've given all of our personal and private data to, to make us feel a little bit safer in those spaces. Right, right. What do you, you know, feel like when somebody's reading this book, you know, what do, they, what do you hope they get out of it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I met a, a trans person yesterday who read the book and she said she laughed the whole time and like that to me felt like the accurate response. Uh, mostly because <laughs> we're <laughs> like I, I feel like the only way 
for me to dismantle the power and the like the cruelty in the messages was to work with Ness and um, really tease out the strangeness of it and really try to make things as wacky as possible. Like we have <laughs> Dixie Chicks references right. and Bonhomme references <laughs> and you know Trump is in there. Like we just like we wanted we we tried to stretch it as much as possible to because I think humor is like a really strong. Um, form of resistance to hate. Yeah. Yeah, they say that... What do you want people to take away from the book? <laughs> right. It was kind of like the humor of it, though. Yeah, yeah. Like, aside from the, the letters itself and the whole the situation and the parts where it gets a little more meta and, and into fruition of, like, real life, I think it was the humor that, for me, got to more of the point of, like, what is really going on. Yeah, with your um, art nest, uh, there was a lot of... It was really bright... Uh, it was very, it was very jovial, but we're talking about a serious thing, talking about combating hate. So, you know, what, what were you envisioning in regards to the level of sort of, of vibrant colors and sort of, like you said, humor that you wanted to put into the artwork for this book? Well, as we discussed before, just like with the, the my work doing like black and white, Typically, um, I think the color was also like that form of resistance in a way of, and the same line of, of humor uh, in, in, with the narrative. So I think with that kind of um, uh, power and using the, the, the medium, uh, I think it really put forth the, the, the story. Like I was at the I was at the conversation yesterday with Junji Ito, and they were talking about the sort of like there's almost like a thin line between horror and humor. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel like the humor in it can sort of help combat hate? Do you feel like it can give it less power? Uh, I, don't, I think it goes both ways depending on the humor, I really. But I do think it's like another form of like a language in between the lines for sure and in terms of like getting to people or whoever is like digesting it to understand instead of just plainly putting it forward like that, I guess. Yeah. Like. What sort of conversations do you feel like this book will continue to have for people that are reading it? Oh, I never think about that. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I should. I, you know, honestly, this is like, this is my first comic book, and so um, I feel like a bit of an interloper here. Uh, I just like, for me, I'm always just like, who and like maybe this is my question for all of you as uh, ostensibly comic book lovers, but I'm so curious who the comic book buyer is. Like, uh, like what is it that a comic buyer is looking for? Like, are you interested in a book about death threats? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like about transphobia. Like, I don't know, right? Like, it's just it's such a different medium to me. Like, um, one of my friends was like is a huge comic book fan, and she's the one that like kind of really introduced me to the forum, and she was like. I don't like reading, <laughs> but like I don't think that that's actually fair to the medium because I think that there's so much happening in comic books that is so like like within each illustration, like the work that you're doing in every panel and every section is like really telling a narrative. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe when we open it up to all of you, you can you can tell us. <laughs> right. Yeah, with comic books, it's you know you're using both sides of your brain, and there's the visual, there's the words. It's not a it's not a novel where you're reading a ton of words, so it, it is a different medium for people that don't necessarily like to read. So when you were when you were kind of making that, when you were, had the idea of doing your first comic, you know what was kind of going through your head about you know, how you wanted to tell this story? Um, well, I mean, like I said, for me, it's a bit of a new medium. And like, it's my friend, Michelle, who's an illustrator. Um, and just like seeing her work and like the recommendations she made was like a big part of it. And honestly, um, encountering Michael DeForge's work uh, a couple of years ago, um, just like had a really profound effect on me in terms of the medium. I was like, oh, you can do that? Like, <laughs> like I honestly remember putting down big kids and just sort of like screaming around my house because I was just like, oh, I, I didn't know that that was possible. And part of it is like in prose, there's such a deep expectation to like have a beginning, a middle, an end, and a climactic arc and a resolution. And you know, you can push against those in fiction, but 
in a graphic novel, like I, and again, I, I don't, I mean this with a lot of respect and maybe it's because it, I'm an interloper, uh, <laughs> but I, I just, I felt like anything was possible and there was something very freeing about that. And so for this project, it was exciting to be like, where can we take this story? Like, where could we, like, how can we push us ourselves beyond what is expected, if that makes sense? Yeah, I feel like with uh, Death Threat, the ending of it was very open mm-hmm. to interpretation. No spoilers, please. <laughs> no spoilers. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, what was your idea of sort of like, I feel like there is space in the story for interpretation, you know? What was sort of the idea of keeping that space there? I, I think that was like a part, like the an integral part of like our whole thing too, cause of, cause because like I feel like comic, uh, or comic, comic art, graphic novels are very kind of like divergent reading. Like it's, it's much of a, your own take um, as opposed, it's like more of a show me, don't tell me, but also read me kind of thing. So, so like in those ways, I think um, that's um, that's what we loved about that, and especially going through the process of it, and, and as we go like changing it and figuring it out, I think I think we had it more open uh, intentionally too, as the medium serves as well. So, as someone who has done so much, you know, music, art, you know, just a lot of different mediums, you know, how does this book sort of fit into your complete body of work? Ah, that's a really nice question. I mean, for me, so a couple of years ago, I, in 2017, I made a film that explored my relationship to suicide, and it was called I Want to Kill Myself, and in a lot of ways, I see Death Threat as kind of like a sister project or a project that sort of closes the loop um, in a way, because I think... Um, one of the things that we we don't necessarily always talk about is the ways that, you know, for me as a marginalized body, I, I think about suicide not just because I have an innate desire to die, but because I live in a world that tells me that I should die. And um, to me, death threat, like, makes that connection more obvious. Um, so, like, yeah, I, I, I tend to sort of situate those two projects together and think of them as, like, a sort of, like, a, a call and answer, if you will. Um, yeah, and then in the rest of like my literary arc, I think part of it is like, uh, like I literally jumped um, genre every book, and I think part of it is because um, there's such a joy when you do something for the first time. There's such an innocence. I don't know if you've had that experience of trying to do the same thing twice, and it's like the second time around, you just like you can't get back to that innocence of the first project. Where right. You, you don't know who Heather's pick is. You don't know like what Globe and Mail's best book list is like you just don't have the parameters and so for me like jumping genres is less about being an interloper and more about just trying to maintain that joy of creativity without the uh, emphasis of expectation that sometimes happens when you oh bless you uh, when you work within a medium if that makes sense oh definitely definitely with um, with all the work that you've done especially with death threat you know, how important is it to be a voice for a marginalized community, you know, for you personally and for just other people out there? I mean, I think that's a complicated question. I try not to speak on behalf of anyone else, but as someone who does have um, a small platform as, uh, you know, as a person of color, as a queer person, as a trans person, I certainly feel a kind of like social responsibility to use my art and my voice to support um, people in my community. Um, yeah, that said, sometimes I, you know, the story I always tells, like once I went to a poetry reading, and I don't know if you've ever been to a poetry reading, but um, they're pretty white, and, um, <laughs> and I put out a book, and that was when I was promoting a book called Even This Page Is White, so it was a lot of fun doing those events. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so here I am, you know, I get up, I do my thing, and obviously, as you can tell from the title, I, the poems are all about, like, experiences of uh, racism, and then this um, white person got up and read their poem about a lawn blower, and I was just like, <laughs> wow, like I, like, I can't imagine the sort of um, freedom and privilege to get to just write a poem about a lawn blower, and I think sometimes I, I want that like I, again I, I take uh, I, I want to be accountable and I want to be 
um, supportive of my communities in the ways that I, I can, but there are moments where I'm like, what kind of art would I make if I wasn't thinking about that sort of thing? Like, mm. can I write a poem about a lawnmower? Like, is there space for me to do that? So, that's a, that's a really good thing you just brought up about when you, when you go into doing any sort of work, and both, both of you can definitely answer this, where do, where do you draw the line about, you know, do I make this art for who I am, this, you know, a person of color, a marginalized person, or do I make that lawn blower that, that you know, that just isn't really attached to anything. There, it's just a thing out there that you're just free to, to do. You know, where do you sort of, uh, you know, draw that line? I feel like they're kind of like interchangeable in a way of kind of uh, liberation or like um, reclaiming that space. Like you can do a, a poem about long, long blower because you want to want to tell people like I can do this. Do this poem, but then I think there's also like a kind of like intergenerational kind of like feelings that you you subconsciously grow up with that you you have you have to do these things in a way you have no choice. Um, especially with like having an audience that pays attention to you and appreciates you. You want to make sure you're being responsible with that kind of audience and what you create and not really haphazardly perpetuate things that you don't want into society that's contributing to the problem. So I think you could do the lawn more. <laughs> but, uh, sometimes I think with marginalized bodies, you, can't, you really might not have that choice or option. Yeah. I mean, I'm actually curious, sorry to jump in here. Go ahead. Um, I'm actually curious for you as like a primarily a visual artist, like do you, but also a marginalized body, like do you feel the same kind of uh, social responsibility to like represent your communities or speak to your communities? Like do you feel that kind of like pressure or accountability? I definitely do feel like the accountability in a Like do you ever want to draw a long blower? I do. Like, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> But um, in, in ways of, um, yeah, like, uh, in ways of, of um, being able to create and responsibly, but also for myself, I feel like it's kind of in both ways where if it does, like, um, nourish myself in that way, it in the hopes kind of translates uh, in this receptiveness towards people absorbing it. But, like, I do feel that responsibility in, in a way where you're, when you know you have that kind of opportunity to do something, you want to make sure it's done right to your own values and, um, and yeah. Nice. <laughs> what do both of you feel like is the the role of an ally to someone of a marginalized community? What do you feel like the you know an, a good ally is? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like. Uh, well, for me as a cis person, like I definitely, um, it's a lot of like just do the learning, do the work, being being aware and being considerate of the people around you and the space you're taking and what you are doing and what you perpetuate into what you do and, what, and the way you live, I suppose. Like there's a lot of ways to do it wrong and right, but I feel like it's a lot of a lot of work to put forth in what's already set up in this kind of colonialized system. Yeah, I mean, like, I think that being an ally, like, requires um, the willingness to be uncomfortable and the willingness to fuck up and still keep trying, because I think a lot of uh, allies, including myself, it's always like, am I going to say the wrong thing, or how am I going to offend, and so a lot of people opt not to speak up or not to act, and I don't think that that's an option. I think that we have to be okay with... Um, using our voices, using our platform, like acting and potentially fucking up and saying the wrong thing and still trying and not being like, oh, well, you know, <laughs> I'm canceled so I can't do anything. I will say, and like this isn't directed at you, but I've, I've just been thinking about this a lot about the ways that like you will never ever go to a panel with white artists and they're net where they're asked, how are you performing allyship? Like that's never something that you'll ever see, like ever, ever, ever. And so like I think that that's something I would love to see, like I would love allies at literary panels and all kinds of like other events to be asking themselves those questions. I was just at a panel for like a diversity festival in um, Brampton 
and the first event was called Rage Becomes Her, and it was all these like women who like some of them had, like traveled and written incredible books, and like we didn't get asked any questions about our writing. It was like, so what are you mad about? <laughs> and you know, it's like you will, again, you will never see a panel of like male authors, you know, being asked how are you navigating, you know, your rage and how are you not taking it out? Like, how are you, you know what I mean? So right. I, I don't know, again, again, this is not directed at you. I just, I think it's important to think about like the burden of answering the question around allyship and just like how that as a starting place, I think, I think allies, especially in the age of the internet, like I feel like they're, they're, the information exists, right? So, yeah. yeah. Oh no, that's definitely something that I've been trying to get better at over the past few years um just you know just a little um history on me i'm from detroit was really involved in the hip-hop scene so i'm a white dude around you know a predominantly black city you know a black hip-hop culture and i got a lot of respect because i was really you know thoughtful in respect of, of the culture there but even as the even as the years have gone on, you know, especially the past few years, I've been more you know aware of how can I be a better ally, you know, and 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 a lot of it is especially for white people. Sometimes you just got to shut the fuck up <laughs> and listen, <laughs> and don't like and don't uh, try to give an answer or a solution. White people love giving solutions. I'll tell you that. But sometimes you just got to ask questions and listen. Yeah, no, totally. And I'm happy to answer. I just think, like, that's a particular question that, like, again, as a racialized person, I, like, I will tell you that, like, 90% of the time that I'm on a panel about art, I will get asked, how do you be an ally? And I just, you know, I also want to talk about my art. Right, definitely. Um, when, you know, we kind of circling around to uh, death threats, where, you know, where do you hope this story goes from here? I hope I can like low-key bully Ness into making another one. <laughs> <laughs> I think she wants Never. to. <laughs> like, no. Um, I don't know. I I really I just genuinely I know this sounds cheesy, but I just genuinely hope that people like read it and and buy it or enjoy it or recommend it. Like you know, again, it feels like such an experiment for me. It's a genre that I have so much admiration for like Jillian Tamaki sitting in the second row and I'm like <laughs> sorry I adore you <laughs> you are a big reference for <laughs> but I was just like you know I have so much admiration for the form that like I think Ness and I have also been talking a lot about how we're like I hope that it's like this is a like uh, a respectful gesture into a genre that we both really care about but actually don't really like we haven't studied properly or haven't you know so um mostly yeah i just hope that it's seen as like a like a respectful gesture in a genre and people like take it up i don't know no, what same thing because I, I do feel like an interloper in many ways because it's like it's such a, a a genre and a practice that i respect so much so much so that i like never dabbled into it because <laughs> i was like this is like making a book movie <laughs> I can't, like, I don't know how and so um yeah doing this i just hope that it's like uh, appreciated and like um, and that like people just read it and maybe it becomes um, as part of like uh, uh, like it becomes in a pool of an audience that can like um, learn to from, from, from it as well. I also hope that like you know I don't think that like everyone should turn um, trolling into art uh, but I, I do think that like for me it was definitely a, a significant coping strategy and so you know I hope that like it inspires people to be thinking about because like I don't think trolling is going to go away and I don't have any preconceived ideas that Twitter's really going to do anything about it so I hope that um, you know it it inspires new ways of thinking about how to navigate um, hate on the internet. Kind of talk about like the emotional journey. You said it was a, a coping mechanism mm -hmm. for it. Kind of talk about both your uh, sort of emotional, you know, <laughs> kind of the emotions that went through like doing it and then after you're done with it. Oh, well, I mean, for me as like creator, like for me, I was like, as much as like I um, dived into um, the, the story and how and the experiences, um, I was very worried about like kind of representing you right and making sure that like there are like kind of like some religious 
um, parts to it, and also like your family. I was like, I gotta get her mom right. Like I gotta just draw this, and portraiture is different for me. So um, uh, in a ways of, of doing the story justice and, and hoping that like like it, everything's put forth in the right places, I suppose was my emotions to it as much as finishing the comic was. <laughs> <laughs> I, we had a tight deadline. Um, <laughs> well, no, I mean, I think, it, like, the truth is, and again, this is, this is, uh, you know, for those of you that are, like, comic experts, this will, uh, you'll be, like, amateur move here, but I, like, all of my books have, well, most of my books have an illustrated component, so I've made a children's book that's illustrated, and a YA book that's illustrated, and a novel that's illustrated, but working with an illustrator in those contexts where it's, like, 16 illustrations is obviously very different than like 70 pages of illustrations, but in my mind, I didn't make that connection. <laughs> I think that both of us, I think we were like both very overly optimistic about, or overly ambitious about what was possible. Um, yeah, and like again, in the context of those mediums, like a children's book illustrator isn't necessarily telling, I, like I feel like the burden of telling the story in graphic novels is is very distinct in a way that doesn't exist in a lot of other illustrated mediums where it's more like accompaniment whereas like I felt like Ness was like telling the story in a lot of ways so um, in terms of emotions I mean, this sounds like such a sick thing to say, but like I actually had so much joy making this project <laughs> about hate mail. Um, and again, I think that that was the point, right? The point was like taking something really disturbing and upsetting and trying to figure out how to make it funny or to pull out the strangeness of it. So for me, I just like, I mean, aside from the stress of like, will we actually finish this book or, or not, um, I, I just had a lot of like fun thinking about yeah just like how to how to make it jokes so what do you say you want to open it up yeah. to the floor yeah anybody yeah. got any questions come on i know you do <laughs> <laughs> All right. hi uh so i was really intrigued by your um on the cover of now like last week or whatever you had um project trauma clown, trauma clown yeah. which I was really, really intrigued by as we're kind of thinking about um, exploring identity, uh, we're all kind of exploring identity <laughs> from an artistic point of view, but there's like a commodification aspect of that, so I was very intrigued by that, and I was wondering if that was in response to maybe, I don't know you work with a photographer with it, but if it was a response to Deb Brett, and if you could just talk a little bit. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so uh, for those of you that maybe saw last week, um, I had the opportunity to write the cover story for now, which is like the alternative weekly in the city. And um, I wrote, a, um, basically I launched last week a photo project called Trauma Clown, which is um, exhibiting as part of Contact Festival for the next month. Um, and I wrote this piece to go hand in hand with it. And essentially one of the things I have noticed in my career, especially in the last like uh, four or five years is that um, well, essentially, like, I, I came into uh, a sort of, like, writing practice by talking about my experiences of pain and oppression and trauma, essentially, and that was my own choice, my own choosing, um, and it was very, quote-unquote, cathartic, uh, but what I didn't realize is by making that gesture that I was sort of uh, falling into a bit of a trap, where, like, now, you know, eight years, nine years after publishing that book, when I approach, you know, publishers, grants, different kinds of art institutions for support to make projects about my lawn blower, they're like, no, 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 we want you to talk about your trauma. We want you to do that one thing. Um, you know, the example that I gave in now is like, I wrote this children's book about raccoons and I've had publishers be like, that's really bizarre. And I'm like, actually, that's the most normal thing I've done. It's a children's <laughs> book about animals. Like, that's act like it, it doesn't act. And they were like, but you know, Vivek, if you want to write a book about gender, and it's like, actually, I've done that. And so I'm in this strange predicament where they just want me to keep doing the same thing over and over again, which is, I make this sort of parallel to clowns, like the way that like the burden of the clown is to repeat over and over again. And so one of the things I, I'm trying to drop visibility to in a lot of ways is just how do we move forward especially as marginalized artists that are sort of expected to reveal our trauma while also balancing sometimes we want to share our trauma and find like what where are the lines there and I think death threat for me is a really good example of where that was my choice like I wanted to create a project that 
took this traumatic experience and you know found like made it funny and I need to I feel like I need to have that choice and the it, it shouldn't be an imposition from the institution so I mean if you've read the article now, I've essentially summarized it for you. But uh, <laughs> I think for me, where it came from, a lot, a lot of it, to be honest, came from last fall and touring I'm Afraid of Men and what it meant to like, uh, so I had another book called I'm Afraid of Men and what it meant to go on stage and talk about how hard it is being trans and then having people every night come up to me and be like, you're so brave. <laughs> you're so brave. I've never, I've never seen anyone like you before. I've never seen <laughs> Like just very touchy too. Like you, you start feeling like an alien. Like it's very right. bizarre. And people are coming from a, a really like kind place. I think. But it's a very strange thing to feel like. Am I just? Am I a clown here? Like, is am I a trauma clown? Like, am I just essentially performing my, my trauma? And like, is this the only way that I can sustain an art career? And that's the message that I'm getting from art institutions. Is for me to like continue to making make art. I have to reveal trauma and like. Lawn blower. <laughs> Lawn blower. <laughs> is, is there, have you found any sort of advice or lessons or solutions to, for any sort of marginalized artists to where they're not, to try to not be pigeonholed like that? Is there any advice that you would give to, to someone? It's a very good question. I have so many opinions, but I'm just trying to figure out how to politically correct, say them in a politically correct <laughs> way. I mean, I think so much of it is really about intention. So, like, you know, I in publishing especially, we're really, really moving to a culture of agents. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, you could submit to a smaller press and not need an agent, but increasingly, like, an agent has become a part of... Um, the industry and you know I think agents do a wonderful job but at the same time I, I just see like young artists being swooped in and getting signed by agents at like 20 21 which I think is supposed to be seen as a sign of success but essentially now what you have is you have another third party like sort of conditioning who and what you are and what you're writing so for instance like I work with a young writer who just like got like met with an agent and she was like I want to write a book about sex work and her agent was like no one is going to buy that book and I'm like it, it like it, it breaks my heart like honestly yeah. like this is no jokes like it breaks my heart that like that is the message that young writers are getting through channels that they're being told are successful right like hearing that you have an agent is supposed to be a sign of success but agents are 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 imposing on young writers right so and that's not all age hashtag not all agents if you're, <laughs> if you're an agent in the room i'm sorry but I, I guess so for me it's just like i i just i want like especially younger artists i just i think so much is about thinking about intention like what is it that you want um, I meet so many, sorry, I'm, I'm going to stop talking. I'm just like, blah, blah, blah. Oh, ahead, but I just like, I meet so many young artists that just want to be famous. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that that's like, you know, get yours. Like, you should have everything. But like, don't forget about the art. Don't forget about like why you're doing what you're doing. Don't let people tell you what to do and not what to do. Like, stay true to the muse. Like, those are, the, I think, the most important things. And I think the industry, whatever that industry is, will always try to push you outside from that. So, like, hold on to this because this is the thing that will will keep you going. You know, I don't right. know. No, I do. Yeah, that's exactly it. And like, I mean, speaking in my experiences, like in, in like art world stuff, like it's like agents are great in facilitating those things, but they are working with the system that's already in place, and they will tell you what is quote unquote the way it works. But it's like um, at the same time, you might like lose yourself in the process out of necessity, working with others. Because like, I don't know about I can't speak for everyone else, but for me, the minute I started working with another person, I do feel like an obligation to to like appease or like exactly. be successful exactly. for them because they're working hard for me too. And then in those same ways, you could lose yourself and your intentions and groundings because of what works and what sells and what people like. But I think it is going back to your intentions and what you what you did this for from the, from the get and like and reminding yourself constantly of that. And also to like think about the systems that you're following and and, and just reminding yourself of what path you're taking along the way as you're taking it, I suppose, yeah. When did you two learn, like, how to sort of balance the, your intentions as an artist with 
the, the big machine that's out there. Balance, what is balance? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like, the, the other thing is, like, I've had to be a business girl, right? So, like, you know, I have made choices because I, I've made strategic choices in my career. And I think as, like, marginalized bodies, we have to do that. We have mm -hmm. to, you know, Ness and I have this conversation all the time. Like, do we take, you know, this particular corporate gig or, or whatever? You know, like, are we selling out? Or all these, like, you know, these big questions. And, like, at the same time, you, like, need to find ways to make money and pay right. your bills, right? So yeah. I think it's a complicated equation. Um, so the, I think the balance is always for me to be found and always, but I think the biggest thing is like, you know, yeah, like I said, like to always stay true. Like I, if it comes to self-publishing my book about raccoons, I will do it. Like <laughs> I just like, like people can say no, but I'm going to make it happen. Right? right. So I think that that's the thing is like, you know, don't take no for an answer. Right. Any other questions out there? Hello. Oh, there's one, and then I'm going to say two just so we don't forget. Two, you. yeah, I got you in the back there. Sorry, I'm, I'm taking over. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> we, we're a crew up here. We're a crew up here. We're, yes. we're a team. <laughs> Great. But she's the leader. She's, she's the leader. <laughs> um, I'm just keeping things going. Uh, I love. Oh, thank you. You read it. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, right after it came out. Oh, that's so yeah, nice. Going to my side and, like, glad to get my Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, I have two questions, but I'll start with one and then like other folks ask. Um, I guess I want to come back to kind of like this uh, something you were saying about like people don't ask me about art, people ask me to educate them mm -hmm. instead. And I think mm -hmm. about that all the time. Like, yes, because you get that too. Yeah, all well, the, the burden of like uh, marginalized artists. Um, having to go out and be like a teacher, like a spiritual guide, um, and then an artist. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my question for you is like, what, for both of you, what kinds of questions do you love being asked? What, 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 would you, what do you wish you were asked um, instead of those like teaching questions? <laughs> I mean, I just, like, I love, like, I, I did this creative writing um, talk in Chicago a year or two ago with Chase, actually, and, like, every single question was, like, so how did you, like, how did you decide where to put the margin? Where, why did you choose <laughs> that word? Why did you not use punctuation? And I'm, like, thank you, sorry, but it's, like, I actually care so much about those things. Like, I actually, like... Like, my brand is aesthetic. Like, I care about the visual presentation. I care about the layout. I care about how things, like, and nest us, too. Like, when, mm -hmm. like, for us, like, using the language of, like, branding and aesthetic was just, like, we have, like, legends, like, like legends after legends in our, in our Google Doc, right? And it's, like, yeah, happy face, like, and not happy face. But, like, it's just, like, it, those are the questions that just feel really great because it's, like, I get to talk about the things that actually I spent a lot of time thinking and, like, why we made those choices. Like, you know, like, why did we choose the color palette we did with Death Thread? Or how do I, like, feel about how Ness represented me? Or, you know, like, I don't know. There's just, like, a range of questions about the actual art that's always just, like, really nice. So, like, those to me are the, the, the questions that, like, make me feel like an artist, which is, you know... Just nice. Yeah, yeah. And again, I take those things really seriously. So it's nice to get to like talk about those decisions, right? I don't know. Yeah. No, like I get all like, I would get like riled up if someone asked me, like, how did you do that? And I'll be like, yeah, well. Like, <laughs> like, use this brush. And like, you know, mediums and processes and stuff. It was so fascinating as like for an artist to figure out the way they come to the end result. Well, for me at least. And, and it's like, it's nice to talk about it because it just talks about the way you've created said work instead of. Um, the, the, the meanings of it, for sure. Totally. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for me, one of the joys of collaboration, too, is I get to learn so much about being in another artist's brain, right? So, like, when Ness is, like, I noticed, like, a stylistic change halfway, and I was like, what is happening here? I'm very curious. And she's like, oh, I'm now working on an iPad, and I'm using this app, and I'm <laughs> using this, like, it's a very different style. And I'm like, tell me more. You know, like, <laughs> I, you don't want to see my stick men, so, like, please. Just, like, you know, so, I, I don't know. Those are the things. And again, I think most artists do have have a lot of intention in their practice and so it's just like yeah anyways thanks for the question about the question <laughs> well, how would well, how would you describe as an as artist figuring that out like you have some you have an idea in your mind how do you figure it out even if, if sometimes it's it isn't there at first 
it? Yeah, the process of it. Oh, like out of necessity? <laughs> 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 like, do it tomorrow. <laughs> do it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me call up all my friends that might know how to oh, do this. Yeah, so, um, oh, do we got enough pencils here? Oh, snap. I don't know. I really like the gestation period. Like, for me, I think we're so hard on ourselves as a culture. Like, I think because of social media and because you constantly see what everyone else is doing, you're constantly like, I'm not making enough. I'm not creating enough. Look at what this person's doing. Look at th what that person's doing. And, like, the thing I have to remind myself on the days where I'm just lying around and watching and the rest of us eating, eating chips is that, like, actually that's part of the creative process. I love Young and like, no, Restless, no, by the way. Okay, well, we should have just talked about that. Like, why aren't we talking about Victor right now? Anyways, right. Um, but, no, but seriously, like, in all jokes aside, like, you know, an idea is like a tender thing. It's like, a, it's like a sapling. It's a seed, and it needs time. And sometimes we're like, you know, grinding that seed when we just like need the time. And so, for me, so much of the creative process is actually like, okay, so I want to make a project that explores this particular theme how and can it develop into that and what's the right medium and asking those kinds of questions. So I, I don't know, I, I feel like we don't talk enough about like the gestation process and how, how important it is for artists to sit around and do nothing, and, like, and, which isn't doing nothing, it's right. doing this, yeah. you know? Yeah, we might be looking out the window, but we're doing but something. But this is happening, yeah. Th this I want to be conscious of, like, you're conscious of your question in the back. Yeah, go ahead, yeah, what's your question about out th back there? Yeah, I love that you stood up. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I'm wondering if you concerns about if you would end up trivializing the subject matter. Ah. Maybe balance that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's serious, right? Like, and again, as a trans person, I'm like, how am I perpetuating, like, you know, themes of like trans violence or like how will my trans sisters in the community feel about this project like you know like am I making light of something that's actually a very serious issue should I be like using my platform to actually not use humor as a device but actually make something very serious about the reality that of transphobic violence you know like those are all very real questions but I think the reality is at least for me is that like we live with that on a day to day and we need joy, we need laughter, we need different ways of like interpreting hate, of like not digesting it. So like, you know, again, this is where the line between, you know, wanting to, you know, be accountable to my community, but also wanting to like, you know, do what feels right for me as an artist, like that dance, and for me as an artist making a serious project about transphobic hate on the internet has like no like that's just twitter you know like twitter is that art form already <laughs> so like i i just i you know so i think it, it is a bit of a, a, a dance i don't know were you worried about us making light of a serious issue is that something that you um no not really because of, uh, <laughs> because of what, what, what we're doing and like what, the way we're creating and stuff like i was worried as like um like a, a non-trans person, a cis person of like what what I might be doing, um, with like like without knowing it and stuff. But then um, I think just like what we were doing in itself, I thought was I wasn't worried about that. With working with you, especially. Like, yeah. Aww. So it's really just like trust, love, trust. Was there any other? Okay. Oh, yeah, and there's one. someone back there too. Uh, sorry, I know this is going to sound really good. It's not my intention. But why are we getting a lot of lower poems? <laughs> I do feel, I really, what you said about always feeling as though you have to write something, create something that um, speaks to your body, your rich self, to your communities. That is such a real thing. Mm -hmm. Thanks would, for saying that. And I would really, and I can't imagine that you would write a long lower poem that wasn't of you. <laughs> so, like, I, well, well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I mean, listen, like, my, my Raccoons book is my Lomb Lore poem, you know? Like, the thing is, like, I'm trying to make that work, and there's, like, actually, like, several projects that I've pitched to several, like, art institutions in Canada, like, that, like, like literally are like, no, 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 we want you to do that thing. And you know what's also really, while, let me just vent for a quick second, is, like, the funniest thing, too, is how they're like, we want you to do that thing that you did two years ago that we wouldn't have picked up two years ago either, you know? <laughs> like, I have a lot of publishers be like, we want something, like, even this page is white. And I'm like, 
three years ago, none of you touched that book. None of you wanted that book. You only want that book because it's been now commodified and the conversations around white supremacy and white allyship and all those things have become so commonplace, right? So it's like, it's very irritating. Right. So I'm like, so let me do my thing. And, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Was there a hand behind you as well? Um, I think I've kind of appropriated a question that you Sure, please. Uh, earlier, sure. But I Working colors. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> what color? <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's such a great question. I like so. We all. I always knew that we wanted the project to be in color, just because, like I said, I think that because it's about death threats and hate mail, like a black and white project. As much as I like, I love what Ness does in her medium. I just worried that in the context of that project, it would just feel very dire. And I felt like color could be used as a way, like as a humorous device, right, as a way to shift the the narrative. And I was really, really inspired by the color palette of Ricardo Cavallo. Ricardo Cavallo. And he uses like very bright, I think he's like a Latin, I feel like he's a Latinx illustrator. I follow him on Instagram and just like very bright primary colors. And I think, you know, the color palette can be very intimidating because there's so many colors. And so I think for both of us, it was, it was useful to sort of like come up with a, a main color scheme to work with. And um, maybe I'll let like Ness way into like your, your thinking around the colors that we ended up Mm, yeah, I think I now call it primary power. Pri right, primary power. <laughs> primary power, yes. Um, I think it was like, um, an, uh, a lot of it was kind of like the decision to like um, make it more like as opposed to somber and the, the desaturation of things. And, and like for me it was a challenge because like I don't use color a lot, but um, since then doing it, I, I really do understand like how lovely it is. <laughs> <laughs> but in a ways of like how it can also like, contribute to like emotions and kind of conveying a mood and, and everything that is open now. <laughs> No, sure. okay. um, and I mean, uh, and this is something that I've noticed after the fact, but one of the things that really excites me about the color, color palette in the context of comic books is like we were talking about yesterday is like, I feel like in a lot of ways it um, appropriates kind of iconic com comic book palette, it, like of like primary colors, like whether that's Superman or Spider-Man and like reappropriates it for this like, you know, resistance against transphobia. So take that Joe Schuster. Yeah. <laughs> Um, looks like we have uh, time for one more question. Hi, okay. had a question. Anybody else? I guess you can go you again. It, okay. You you end it. Um, yeah, this is like a I guess also like a technical question. Like when I think about uh, the genre of narrative, you wrote with it. Um, like I would categorize that as like autobiograph autobiographical or like memoir. Um, but when I think about the, uh, like the style of art, and I'm, this is, I'm like, newly introduced to your artists, um, like it's, it feels more like surreal or magical. Uh, I'm like, and I was wondering like what the intention was, or like what it felt like to have those two genres kind of intersect with each other. I mean, for me, the story is very much like, I mean, there's certainly like the strong nonfiction elements, but like to me, it really blurs the line between fiction and nonfiction. That was something that like always excited me about the project was like thinking about like really pushing the narrative beyond what happened and to sort of like, you know, kind of what you were saying earlier, right? Like the end is sort of ambiguous, like sort of like not knowing what happens and like what is real. Like there's a lot of questions that have been asked, like, you know, about the cease and desist, like, did that really happen? Like those kinds of things. And some, you know, all the letters that I got, like the actual letters that were received are all in its entirety. But a lot of the other stuff, there's a lot of fluidity there as someone who like, you know, also really likes creative nonfiction. I think Ness's work does have that sort of like surrealist, like dreamy quality that like lends itself like well to a sort of uh, hybrid narrative, if you will. I don't know. No, I really liked, um, 
our combination together in terms of like the story and also just visual elements blending because like a lot of my work is like much autobiographical but like in ways of kind of conveying something that I can't even say like I don't even know how to tell tell you but I can draw it for you so I feel like in a way we complemented each other because I wanted to kind of say your story in the right feeling of it so like um, and I'm like really Nailed it. <laughs> and I'm making sure that it's, it's uh, felt with um, the piece as much as it is it's visually digested. Yeah. Thanks for your questions. All right, great. It was uh, great talking with Vivek and Nask. Thank you so much. Give a round of applause. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. We super, super appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. All right, that was the audio from the Spotlight panel with Vivek Sharia and Ness Lee for their book, Death Threat, recorded at the Toronto Comic Arts Festival this year in Toronto last month in May. It was a, it was a gr good, enlightening panel. I think it re went really well, and I did learn a lot of things um, in regards to, you know, their perspectives about things. So it was an awesome thing to uh, be a part of. And hopefully I can be a part of more, uh, you know, panels in the future, be able to moderate stuff like that. I definitely had a fun time. And uh, TCAF was amazing as a whole. Um, just think of it as just like the artist alley of, you know, these big conventions, you know, and that's what it was, you know. And it was, it was held at the, at the reference library in Toronto. It's a free two-day event. And it was amazing. And... The artists there, it was a wide array of artists. It was just kind of like an even playing field of people of different age groups, race, gender, sexuality. So you get you got all these different views and, and just amazing art from everybody. And it was such a great vibe. So if you ever can, you know, it's, at, it's in like May of every year, I guess. Go to, uh, you know, go to the Toronto Comic Arts Festival. It's an amazing, amazing event. All right. Thank you for listening. Goodbye and good night. Fresh is the word.